Hello, everybody, and good evening. You are locked in to Keep Six uh, Empowerment to Unlock the Justice System. Tonight, we will be discussing mental health and trauma within the criminal justice system. We are streaming live right here, direct on Facebook, as well as our YouTube channel. So please let your friends know, friends and family know that we are here live. I am your host and moderator, Natasha Pennycook. I'm a registered psychotherapist and I am the mental health advisor for Keep Six. I provide psychotherapy, workshop facilitation, speaking engagements, and clinical consultation work with those who have been impacted by trauma, anxiety, and depression to heal, thrive, and live their best life. Tonight, we have a powerhouse panel of community members who will be sharing their experiences of mental health challenges impacted by the criminal justice system, as well as mental health professionals who will shed light on the mental, the emotional, and the physical impacts of the criminal justice system. We will also be talking about trauma. Um, and how the criminal justice system can cause mental health issues to occur. So tonight on our panel tonight, we have Warren, we have Dr. Natasha Williams, we have Damian Blackman, and we have Maria. So thank you everyone for joining us here. So what I'm going to do everyone is allow you to introduce yourselves tonight. So Warren, we're gonna start with you. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, no problem. First of all, I just want to say I'm so happy to be amongst all, all these uh, lovely people on the panel. Thanks, guys, for, for inviting me. Thank you. Um, yeah. Hey, guys, my name is Warren. Um, I'm a, a father of four. Um, I've had a colorful past. Um, right now, I'm, I'm a youth worker, but before I, I, I was involved with gangs for, uh, when, when, I was, when I was younger. Um, unfortunately, that got me into the prison where I spent 10 years, um, but I turned my life around and on, upon my release, um, I'm trying to make a positive impact to my community. Amazing, thank you, Warren. Dr. You're Natasha, we'll, we'll continue with you. Hi, first of all, thank you again for uh, inviting me onto this great, great platform and, and with such great panelists. So thank you so much for that. I am Dr. Natasha Williams. I'm a clinical rehabilitation and counseling psychologist. I've been a psychologist now for approximately 15 years, and I've been in independent practice for those 15 years. Currently, I am the owner and part owner and clinical director of Allied Psychological Services, as well as the president of the Association of Black Psychologists. So uh, in the midst of all of that, um, I work with a variety of individuals from a variety of backgrounds. And I look at anything from anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder and trauma. And I know trauma we're gonna be talking a little bit about today. Um, but also we have to look at um, cultural relevance of, of uh, psychotherapy as well as psychology in and of itself. So a lot of the work that I've done has been looking at how do we decolonize a lot of our psychotherapeutic practices, um, including the assessment tools that we use and the therapy interventions that a lot of times are not created for our communities. So that's also been a passion of mine as well. So other than therapy and assessment, I do clinical consultation. I supervise other therapists and, you know, when I actually have a moment to blink, I, <laughs> um, you know, we do a lot of uh, speaking training and speaking engagements here and before COVID around the world. Thank you. Thank you, Natasha. And we'll continue with Damien. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Good evening. I'm Damien Blackman. I'm father of two, a young man who grew up in the streets. Uh, street hustler turned entrepreneur, um, did a little bit of time in um, in um, jail and came home to decided to make a change and help my community, help the people in, the com in my community make a change and put it better. So I'm, I'm the owner of a dump truck company called Jada Inc. And that's what I do. So I teach um, young gentlemen like myself, black, black kids especially, how to become owners in the dump truck industry or trucking period and just change your life around. And uh, yeah, that's basically it. So that's my um, my give back to the community. Amazing, thank you. thank you. And Maria, we'll wrap up with you. Yeah, so I'm Maria Watkins and I'm uh, a narrative therapist, which is a type of therapy that, that is outside of, 
of conventional therapy. And I am a mental health school counselor, and I work with little kids from kindergarten all the way to grade six and their families. And I did a stint as a psychotherapist and a program coordinator for an abuse, um, a violence, anti-violence program in the city that I was living in, in St. Albert, Alberta. And I've worked for 19 years in schools and with families in mental health and school counseling. Uh, I've worked with families and kids all around all kinds of issues like um, abuse and uh, the effects of trauma, the effects of abuse, lots of bigger dysregulation in children, not being able to um, handle schooling. And, um, and when I worked with adults, with women and children, I worked around um, violence and abuse, uh, drug abuse and misuse. Um, I am a, a graduate from University of Alberta and the kind of therapy I do is called narrative therapy, which is not part of conventional ther therapy at all because we do not see people as problems. Uh, we see problems as problems and that there are people's pain are often a reflection of a public policy and a political action that needs to take place. Um, and so uh, our therapy has to be linked to, to changing things economically and, and politically. Um, in doing narrative therapy, we know that no one is ever always under the influence of a problem. And when there is despair and when there is trauma, it is also, there is also a second story of deep values, of precious values and of um, competency that gets hidden by problems. And I'm trained to ask questions so that people can reconnect to those, those importances, those beliefs, those hopes that get blinded by problems. And I am never the expert in the room in someone's lives. I'm expert at asking questions, but the expert in the room is the person I speak to because they know their life best. So in the kind of therapy I do, the narrative therapy, the, the therapist no longer is the expert. The expert answers come from our clients. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. Thank you for adding to this conversation. And also, I just want to mention that we had um, Kevin originally, who was supposed to be on this panel. Unfortunately, he's not able to be with us today. And he works with the SAPSI program, so the Substance Abuse Program for African Canadian and Caribbean Youth at the Center for Addictions and Mental Health. So he will not be on with us tonight, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So we are having this conversation on mental health and trauma. So what I wanna do is I speak, those of you who know me from different Keep Six platforms know that I speak about trauma quite often. But tonight I wanted to get um, Dr. Natasha to talk about trauma, triggers and PTSD very much from a clinical aspect. Right, thank you, uh, Natasha. So um, if we're talking about it from a clinical aspect, we'll, we'll go from, you know, how it is sort of seen sort of diagnostically and then some of the barriers, if you want to call that, of that, of those diagnoses, right? So if we talk about just trauma, uh, trauma is usually a very disturbing event that has occurred with the individual. Now, this is according to our DSM or our diagnostic manual. It's usually a distressing or disturbing event that has occurred um, to an individual or witnessed by an individual, which causes very deep and disturbing symptoms for an individual. Now, these symptoms are usually broken down in terms of uh, different categories um, in, in the DSM, and the, we look at things like re-experiencing. So how does this person re-experience the, the traumatic event? And that would include anything such as nightmares, flashbacks, disturbing thoughts, um, you know, uh, persistent disturbing thoughts, um, you know, how do they then, um, how does it affect their affect, such as, you know, remaining flat or down or depressed as a result of the, of the traumatic event? Um, or what are some of the re-experiencing symptoms that they have? So do we notice things like hypervigilance? Um, do we notice things like exaggerated startle response, um, avoiding situations that remind them of the disturbing event? So these are just a couple. I know I didn't want to get too, too diagnostic, but just enough to give just a little bit of a flavor of, of what post-traumatic stress disorder is and trauma. 
Now, the, the difficulty with the diagnostic aspect of, of post-traumatic stress disorder is they really do aim to link it to a specific event. So for example, if there, if a person was robbed, if a person was raped or, or whatever the case may be, they aim to tie it to a specific event for it to fit DSM diagnostic criteria. And if it's not necessarily tied to a specific event, other than uh, individuals that are first responders, they're the only ones that are on the outliers outliers of this of the diagnosis. And this is as per the the the, the most recent diagnostic manual, which is the DSM five. So if you're not a first responder who is susceptible to multiple disturbing events, if you don't if you're not exposed to a particular event either being the actual victim of it or witnessing it then it says that you don't meet diagnostic criteria for post traumatic stress disorder now what's interesting and i'm pretty sure we're going to talk about this a little later so i'll try not to jump the gun um we then have to talk about people within, for example, the African Canadian community, and we talk about transgenerational and racial trauma, which does not meet criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder as per the DSM. But I'm not gonna jump the gun, Natasha, because I'm pretty certain that we're gonna talk about that a little later. But when you have multiple traumas, and especially from a generational or you know a multi-generational perspective, you will notice a very similar symptomatology in regards to trauma, but it's not seen as a diagno as a diagnosis, um, which again might be you know maybe a good thing or a bad thing. But what happens is 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 that a lot of times the symptoms are belittled as a result. Oh, the person doesn't have post traumatic stress, so you know they don't meet diagnostic criteria, so we don't we don't have to treat trauma. So that's where some of the difficulty lies, but I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. Okay, thank you, thank you. And Marie, I want to ask you, can you speak a little bit on trauma in terms from a, from a childhood perspective? Oh, Maria, you're on mute. <laughs> thank you, uh, there you um, go, there you go. I'm not sure what you want me to say about it. It's, it's, it is usually about around some kind of abuse or disturbing event. Mm -hmm. And what happens with children is that, um, it gets acted out in schools. Uh, sometimes these children are dysregulated. Uh, sometimes they are withdrawn and shut down. And um, so what I try to do is when I notice these things, uh, you know, after doing some chatting with them, I, I contact parents to get them connected to trauma therapists for their children and their family. Okay. And yeah, so, so if that's what you mean, how would I address that? Mm -hmm. uh, that's how. Okay, thank you. So Warren, I wanna ask you, I know when you and I spoke, you spoke with me about how mental health impacted your life as a youth. Do you care to share a little bit? Yeah, sure. Um, mental health, when I was a, a youth, it was pretty much the elephant in the room that no one really talked about. Um, I wasn't even, you know, taught anything about it in school or in, at home. It was like something that, of course, you know, that wasn't in our household, but it was. Um, it was a stigma, you know what I'm saying? Something that was on the hush, especially in our, our culture and our community. Um, the impact it had, it was, you know, the results of, uh, I'm seeing all my friends doing things that I didn't understand. You know, like um, people call them demons and people call them like bad seeds, bad breeds. But in reality, they're just um, victims of whatever mental health issues they were, you know, facing um, with the lack of help or the lack of um, uh, recognizing the problem. Obviously, they couldn't, you know, fix it. So things just got worse. And um yeah, so my, my, my childhood was definitely impacted by, by mental health, um, just for the sheer fact that it was like a silent killer. Wow, wow. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. And it's interesting how you mentioned like a silent killer. I think that's very appropriate to mention that way. And as you said, people in your community used to say things like if it was demons or things like that, right? But a lot of times when we are not taught, when we don't have a mental health language, when we don't have um, 
an emotional vocabulary, all of these things that we end up experiencing, they get hushed, hushed inside us. And as you and not having a community or even within your household to talk about it, where do you go? Right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So as a youth, um, and you probably alluded to this already, what what were you aware of? What are some of the things that you were aware of in terms of mental health? Um, I was aware of very little. Um, the, the, I guess when it came to mental health, I was aware of um, kids in special classes um, mm -hmm. or adults who, you know, had like Down, syn Down syndrome or whatever the case was. And that was like the to totality of what I knew of mental health. Everything else was just like, oh, you're just you're not strong enough to handle that situation like you know what i'm saying yeah, whereas yeah. um if somebody were to you know be fully diagnosed with like you know having anger issues or ptsd you can you know address them in accordingly but um yeah the, the, that, that wasn't the case when i was a kid so if it wasn't like a full-on mental disorder like such as like again down syndrome or something that's you know like something that you can actually see it was something, it was considered a weakness and therefore uh, the stigma was placed on it and everybody was quiet about it and you had to deal with it in your own way. And unfortunately, a lot of people didn't deal with it in the most productive way, at least in my community. Right, right. Yeah. And it's interesting because when Damien and I had a conversation, he spoke a little bit about um, his childhood and his childhood experience. Damien, do you want to jump in here and, and um, speak of that? Sure. So my childhood was um, a bit rough. Um, I was physically abused by my mother's husband, I'll call him that, and uh, for many years. Um, so we had left Canada. I left, no, I left Barbados when I was nine, ten years old and came to um, Jane and Driftwood. So we lived there for a few years. Then we moved up to Scarborough in the Galloway area. And it started then. I would just first like a little smack, then it just started getting beaten for no reason, right? And then I remember we lived in Oshawa and it was this happened for many, many years. I would just spend lots of my time in, in like in, in a bedroom because I wanted to stay away from like the stresses and the, the abuse that I was undergoing. And I remember, I remember the last time it happened, I still have the marks on my arm when I got, I got, we call beat by with an electrical cord the um the iron cord so i have the mark on my arm and the police came and when the police came i was removed from the household and i think i was like what 14 at this time and well 13 14 and we were living in oshawa at the time and i had to go live with um my mother's church friends in back down in toronto so a young child who has no friends no real family um because we're the only ones here um just going through that just trying to navigate life as I understood it. And I didn't understand much. I just wanted to know why I was abandoned, right? So then you grow up with those those issues that in turn, you didn't realize that, I, well, I didn't realize it was trauma at the time. I just had these thoughts that I just had to navigate and by myself, there was no one to speak to. And like Warren said, there, there's not much, you, you they chuck it up to, well, you may be crazy or you're weak. Right, or they laugh at you when you're trying to explain yourself and the best way you know how, you, you know, you can't really explain something that, that you've never um, been through before. So it's a hard time trying to right, expound on that. And that was difficult. So you grow up, well, I grew up um, not trusting many people or not knowing who to speak to because anytime as in our community, we're looked at as weak, right? We're far from, but we don't wanna appear weak, we're just, literally trying to get some help and some answers. And that was the case for me as it was, I guess, for a lot, a lot, many, many other people. Thank you. And it's true. You mentioned about that weakness and a lot of times, especially from Caribbean households, we are taught of as weak and that emotions are weakness and sadness is weakness and all of that, all of the what were considered, I guess, the being too emotional, quote unquote, those are looked at as weak. So a lot of times we may try not to look that way, but then what happens, right? A lot of times the anger is more appropriate to show 
right. than the crying and then the tears and all of that. So a lot of us are, are taught to show the anger and to hold on to the sadness and to the and that's, when that's when everyone seems to listen to you anyway, when you finally blow up and then they're like, well, what's wrong with you? Why are you so mad? Well, I've been trying to tell you this for many, many years, but yes. you weren't listening to me because I'm too emotional. But then when I'm angry, I'm too angry. So it's like, what do I do? We leave, we turn to vices in the, in the neighborhood. Exactly, exactly. And we have a comment here from one of our audiences, Melissa. She says, I feel like my parents came from a generation where they were taught that particular conversations just didn't happy, happen. They didn't know how to do things any different. And it's true, right? There are some generations of, uh, of folks of our parents who were not taught about emotions, not taught about emotional, um, emotional intelligence and things like that. And if you think about, there's a lot of people who ascribe to post-traumatic slave um, disorder who, right, showing weakness, especially if you go back from colonialization, showing weakness meant that you were not gonna be safe. Right. Showing weakness meant that you are either going to be um, thrown in a different part and your children taken away and all of that. But if you look at that from that angle, we look at how that has evolved over the time and over the generations, and not only intergenerational, but multi-generational traumas that come out from that. So then, right, Warren and, and Damien speaking about not having an emotional vocabulary, and I speak about this too growing up, did not have emotional vocabulary. So like, where do we find this from? Mm -hmm. We really do, and we want to be heard, we want to be seen, and the anger wow. gets, so that's what we turn to, right? Yeah. Um, Damien, thank you for sharing. And you spoke a little bit about um, being taken by the child welfare system. Maria, you had mentioned that you work with the child welfare system. How are you able to work with the child welfare system and then also meet people where they're at, especially within our community? Um, in Alberta, there has been a change in child welfare where in sort of taking children away and being punitive with adults, they come from a solution-focused model where uh, they're looking for things that do work well in the house and they're willing to have workers that work with the families and are in the families for long periods of time to kind of modeling peaceful parenting and setting limits in, in peaceful ways and, and looking for extended family who may not be um, uh, using violence or uh, to, to help children and to help parents who are stressed and working and taking care of children. And so they are working in a much more um, collaborative model with families rather than a punitive model. So if, if that's what you mean. But when I, if I work with trauma, I know that there are always two stories. When there's a traumatic story, there is also a story that goes alongside that story that's, that all never ever gets uh, asked about. And it's called the secondary story. And it's often stories of things that no one ever is a passive receiver of trauma. Mm. Children cry, children hide, children protect their siblings, even little children. And so there are always acts of resistance and acts of strength that never get asked about. And when people stand in that story, that secondary story that runs alongside the trauma story, they're able, they're able to look at the trauma from a different lens and recover um, from some of the damage and the effects of the trauma. And, and so that's how I would work with a, a, a child or adults who experience trauma to take them out. Because just talking about the traumatic event can take you down into the river of trauma and re-traumatize you. But speaking it from, from a place of safety, in which you, where, where you don't get taken over by the pain of it, and, and noticing that secondary story and, and having that story become more rich and more detailed leads us um, in ways to recover ourselves and recover our hopes and recover our, our intentions of coming to this planet. Thank you, Maria. So someone from our audience is asking you, Maria, specifically, to speak a little more on um, on treating trauma from a narrative standpoint. So if you could yeah. briefly um, yes, that's what answer I was, that. I was explaining it, it, um, that from a narrative point of view, there's not just the trauma story. There is the other story that moves alongside it, which is a secondary story that needs to be asked about. 
because when people stand in that story, um, we begin to find out um, that they were not just passive receivers, even children. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Damien, I want to go back to you for a second, because when we spoke, you you mentioned about only realizing later on as an adult that you had experienced childhood trauma. Can you speak about how you came to this realization later on as an adult? Reading. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Literature. Yeah. They say majority of the stuff you need to know is in a book. So I, I like yeah. reading. I, actually, I love reading. And when I was incarcerated, um, I picked it up even more because it was an escape from my surroundings. So I loved it even more because I didn't really spend too much time in jail because I was always, my head was in a book somewhere. So I took that time to study. So I, I learned a lot about traumas and childhood traumas and the stresses and how trauma really never leaves the body and how to identify the traumas and what trauma really is, right? Like, why am I the way I am? Why do I think this way? Why do I behave this way? Why do I, right? So then you realize, oh, those are things that happened to me during my childhood that I've used as escape or coping mechanisms that may have not been healthy, may have been um, more in survival mode back then. But now that I'm an adult, I'm not supposed to be um, living in survival mode, but thriving mode, right? But we can't, we can't live in thriving mode if we're still on survival mode. So we don't even know how to get from point A to point B because another trauma was growing up, not having an avenue to talk about these things. So we don't know how to, we don't even know how or who to speak to, right? Like we were we were having the conversation the other day and we had like a, a, a little 10, 15 minute- Therapy <laughs> session. <laughs> For the first time it was so deep and it was, um, it wasn't, it wasn't intentional, but it was um it was um, a non-judgmental listening ear who understood so i think innately i wanted to my soul had that outlet to speak you know and i think that's so many that's, that's the issue with so many youngsters in our generation and our our culture we want to we want to speak but we don't know how to so i felt comfort with my homies, the gang, the streets, and doing all this stuff because they understood 100% they were riding with me. I had I had a family. Mm, like, wow. So, yeah, and that's how, yeah, reading. Reading was how I came about knowing yeah. about the traumas okay. and stuff in my life. Okay. Okay. Oh, thank you for that. And it's interesting because when we did have our conversation, that's when we talked about the, the survival mode and the thriving mode. And yeah. knowing that there's these two different points is how do we get to that middle point where you can heal, right? Mm -hmm. And and I think even you being here and having this discussion and, and openly talking about the things that you've gone through as a child really helps you to get to that healing mode to be able to talk about and also being able to connect because you're not only connecting with the five of us here but there are people here watching on youtube and on facebook and people are hearing your story and they're resonating with a lot of people out there so this work that you're doing for yourself know that it's also helping those around you and your community i know this is one of the things that you you're you're very passionate about wanting to help your community so you're doing it right now by having this conversation and, i'm curious to ask damon damien what got you onto reading? That is, you know, that's not a typical thing. That's, you know, was there a person? Was there a TV show? Was there something that introduced you to reading? My mother. Yeah. Yeah, my mother. She is an avid reader. My family, period. But my mom, we grew up seeing my mother read mm -hmm. everything. So when we were younger, um, we had to read a lot. And I was just speaking to one of my friends yes, mm -hmm. yesterday, two days ago, that I remember when we were younger, we would ask a question, mom, what does this mean? And she would mm -hmm. go get the dictionary. She would never tell us. Mm -hmm. and it, I remember, I'll never forget this, this red, thick Webster's dictionary. Webster. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And we would, we would go in there. So that taught us to always read and go for research. So I grew up, we grew up loving that. Even to this day, like my son, I don't know if he's on here, but he knows they get books for, uh, <laughs> they get books for gifts, man. Mm -hmm. Toys, no, nothing like that. Not as much, but you're gonna hold this book and yeah, read that because but there in the middle of a chaotic family was a gift. Yes. Yeah. So it's not a family's not deprived, even though there can be trauma in a family. It is not deprived. Right. No, I like I, I like the commenter mentioned um, earlier. 
I can't really fault my family and my mother because they were living on experiences and that they that had, they had prior. Yeah. They weren't learning as, as we did, right? So I know they had their traumas that they were dealing the best with without an, out, without an outlet to express themselves as well. So it was all generational um, curses and, and habits passed down. So I don't fault them or blame them because at a certain age, you have to take control of what your future and what happened to you, right? Can't blame anyone. I'm not a child anymore. So mm -hmm. I, I take my responsibility for finding what I need to, to find. Yeah, definitely. I was here laughing because I feel like that must be a Bajan mother thing with the Webster dictionary because <laughs> my mother used to do the same thing. <laughs> no, uh, Natasha, no, Natasha, it's not just a Bajan thing. Oh, okay. Do, my family. So right, right across. So, <laughs> Dominican Caribbean thing. But yeah. ours, wasn't, ours wasn't red. It was a huge brown leather bound <laughs> um, dictionary that we always had to go to. So yes. It's I, amazing how we just remember the color and the right. exact detail. Right, and, and the thickness of it, right? <laughs> right. Exactly. right. Oh, goodness. So Warren, I wanted to ask you, I know that when we spoke, you were talking about, I was asking you, like, were you able to get the help that you needed within the prison system? Uh, to answer shortly and bluntly, hell no, um, in, in, in the prison system, <laughs> in the prison system, um, they actually do more to contribute to, to, to your mental, um, health issues than to, you know, alleviate it or find some kind of, you know, remedy for it. Um, like Damien, I, I, I came to realize that a lot of the actions um, that I used to do as, as a youth stemmed from um, particular uh, mental health issues that I was experiencing, such as like, you know, anger issues, um, depression, stuff like that. And I learned that when I was an adult. Um, I spent most of my adult um, time in behind bars. So once I learned that behind bars, I started seeking, you know, help for myself. Um, I put in numerous requests uh, to see, you know, psychiatrists, therapists, even psychologists, everyone. But um, when you're behind bars, um, maybe David can t attest to this as well. When you're behind bars, you, you have to be like pretty much suicidal to get the help that you need. If you're not suicidal, like pretty much they just write you off or they just give you like an antidepressant or something and just tell you to hold that. Right. But then um, when they give you that antidepressant, that's another stigma with that, because right. now you're taking meds. And any form of weakness, right. any show of weakness, especially in a place like that, it's it's not, you know, it's yeah. not something that you want. So, um, yeah. no, <laughs> there was no real help um, when I was incarcerated. Um, yeah. One of the things that really stood out to me with our conversation, Warren, was that you told me that the waiting list for programs and services what, could mm -hmm. sometimes be two years. Mm -hmm. two years unless you're suicidal, which then brings a whole lot of other things, right? In terms of weakness and things like that. So um, right. can you speak about the programming and the services? Like what, what was available to you? If the waiting list for some services and programs were two years, what was available? What was readily available? Readily available? Um, you can talk to your celly, maybe. Um, you can talk to your family. You could try to talk to a guard, but I wouldn't advise that. Right. Um, things are readily available. Again, it was just they'll tell you to put a request uh, to healthcare and tell them what 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 ails you, and then the nurse will pretty much just give you an antidepressant um, okay. unless you say you're suicidal, and then that's that's pretty much it. And I, I hate to sound bleak, and I hate to like that. This is just my experience, and I'm not sure if it, it varies because I don't maybe like different cultures or whatever the case is. But I just know like when I was seeking help, there was not there was nothing, and um, like the most they gave me was antidepressants, and and that didn't go too far for me. So yeah, there was <laughs> there was nothing. There's it sucks. nothing. Um, yeah. yeah, it does suck to be plainly. It does suck. And what about you, yeah. Damien? Were you able to access any mental health, mental health services? No. <laughs> no, there's no mental health services. The most, the only programs that I um, encountered were like what chapel, and I think that's that's about it. Like, yeah, that's about it. That's it. Chapel. Oh that's it. 
Okay. Yeah. So I would hold, we would hold, we would hold our own Bible study and stuff like that. We would ask to go into the room and we'd the guys on the range would go in our in like the, the program room and we would basically do that. We would teach ourselves, right? Because like Warren said, you're writing a request and they're not looking at that. You know what I mean? And if they do, like he said, they're gonna just come give you a, a pill or or just tell you nothing, right? They're gonna go look at the kids who are or the people who are going going through it physically or visibly going through it. Uh -huh. Like suicidal guys or the guys who are banging their head against the wall or screaming all night, getting the attention, right? But a person that you are not uh, Warren and I that who may appear sane on the outside, outside, right? We're not getting the um, the attention that we so desperately need. Yeah, for right. sure. Yeah. So um, Natasha, I want to turn to you. Do you feel that the criminal justice system is adequately set up for prisoner success, based on our stories and based on what we know and mm -hmm. You really want me to answer I am. That. I really want you to add to that. Yes, I do. I do. And there's definite people who are watching want to know from a psychological perspective. Oh, <laughs> absolutely not. Right. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, it is absolutely not set up. Now, mind you, I have not worked directly in the system uh, per se, but I knew, uh, you know, the some of the psychologists that would be working in the, the prison system, first of all, few and far between. Um, they're usually inundated with a significant caseload. And then on top of that, um, a lot of times there, there's not a cultural uh, variety, you know, yeah. so a lot of the, the psychologists are Caucasian. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. you know, when you're looking at the sort of the prison population and, you know, again, in what the research shows in regards to, you know, the disproportionate amount of, 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 uh, of individuals from African descent and indigenous who are incarcerated and you don't have services that reflect that as well, you know, reaching out for help is one thing, but then are you then receiving the adequate help that you even need once you exactly. get it? Exactly. You know, and that in and of itself now is another issue. Um, and, and so then no, it, it's not adequately staffed, not adequately served. And I think what happens is, is that you have now people that are then released who are ill-equipped once they are released because they haven't received the, the the treatment or whatever services that they needed to increase their likelihood of success right. once they leave. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, it definitely sticks out to me, more from our conversation about the two-year waiting list. So, um, Natasha, again, what can, how can this impact a person, two years waiting? for services, like what is the impact of that? Well, absolutely, I mean, two years of sitting with this, you know, with this angst, with this yeah. dialogue, with these symptoms, the longer that the symptoms stay and they are not treated, is the longer that, you know, the 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 poison festers, if you wanna, mm -hmm. if you wanna use an analogy, right? Which means that it's not saying that it's not impossible to um, to overcome, but the longer that they remain untreated, the more substantial the the uh, the symptoms become and remain and become entrenched. So then, when a person actually finally, if they do have an opportunity to receive um, treatment, it usually means that it's a longer. Um, a longer treatment protocol. So it would usually, you know, come about with about years of, of a possible psychotherapy because you're now trying to really delve in to trauma as well as symptoms that have been untreated for a significant period of time. So, you know, to make a to make a long, a long uh, answer shorter, you know, definitely it has it has a significant impact. If people are waiting two years and they're in there for you know, how many years, which means you have significant psychological and psychiatric issues that are that are going on within the prison system that the system is ill-equipped to deal with. Yes, exactly. So in those two years as you're waiting, not only are you not getting the help that you needed originally, right? but then you have to start to unpack everything that has happened within those two years before you can get to the initial ask. 
That's that's it's the, yes, it's so problematic. So that's, problematic. That's it. So that's where the it, the layers come in. It's like you're chiseling through layers, right? You're trying to deal with what are some of the symptoms that are initially at the surface, but those surface symptoms have roots. Yes. Right. So then now you have to now try to figure out how to get to those roots while you hopefully help them with the symptoms that they're being presented with presently. So, you know, what you're doing is excavation. Mm. Right. And then the longer that the, the an individual is not being treated in the system, the deeper the excavation has to happen. Yeah. Yeah. So. You know, the criminal justice system is actually exacerbating what mental health issues are already there in the first place. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then you do have what I think um, both Warren and Damien mentioned about what, you know, instead of treating the, the mental health illnesses, what you're doing is placating them. Yeah, pacifying by, it. You know, here's, here's some medication. Right. And I'm not saying and I'm not I, I'm, as a psychologist, I don't prescribe. So I want to be very clear uh, with that as well. And I'm not anti medication. Mm -hmm. But where the, I find the difficulty lies is, is that when you only have the option of medication, you're really not looking at what is the root cause of the problem. What what coping mechanism, what strategies, how is a way that a person is thinking, um, you know, uh, the, the trajectory of how they've been thinking, what are there some of their, their childhood issues? What are some of those things as a psychotherapist and a psychologist, you would begin to unpack to assist the individual in their own healing instead of placating and just numbing the, the symptoms and not getting to the root. Exactly. Exactly. And Maria, you mentioned when we, we spoke, you talk, you, and I love this, you talk about like how important it is to, to source those services early on. Can you speak on that, especially like sourcing those resources in childhood and youth, how important it is? The problem that I'm having is uh, that counseling in schools has become so limited. It's more of a re referral service. So I end up doing that instead of doing the work. But what, uh, what happens is that um, neighborhoods where there are agencies and therapists that are free, like in, this, in the city that I work in, they have two free therapists that you can get in to see quite early, uh, you know, not two years, maybe a month. <laughs> um, I try to hook up families right away when children are, are showing distress in school. I try to call those families and get them into those services right away. I'm not, I think that in areas where there's economic uh, trouble, they don't have those services around, you know? And so in our community, there, there are subsidies for families to do sports and, uh, or artistic or recreational or activities for free. Um, there's ki kids sports. There are um, counseling services that they can have as a family. Because lots of times when uh, children are having, um, even with the Alberta Health Services in Alberta, they will only see the child. Well, children have very little power. This, yes. needs, this needs to be a team. This needs to be mom and dad and the school. Everyone's team with the child against the trouble. And so um, when we do this early, families are much more successful schools are more successful in helping kids um stay in school rather than be kicked out and and eventually uh, lots of these kids who have behavioral problems that are coming from abuse and trauma get with zero tolerance policies get sent out of school yeah. and, and do end up on the streets and end up in in, in prison sometimes right so that's like that's directly that school to prison pipeline yeah so early intervention is really important so you got to have the resources. So, so even not being in prison, but even in the communities, it's very hard to get mental health in a uh, timely way. Mm -hmm. If you have benefits and you have money, maybe, but many people can't afford it. And so families don't get the support. And sometimes even the therapy they get is very blaming. It's mm -hmm. not very empowering. It's not very related. Uh, it doesn't take into context that people have different cultural backgrounds. West Indian people have collective ideas about raising children. Yes. Uh, and so these, these are not taken into account. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And you know, you make such an excellent point that the, the way in which you work with not only 
the issue, and I like how you said that, how your work, it's the parents and the teachers and the children against the problem. problem. We are not our problems. Yes. The problem is the problem. Problems come and they go. They are not always in our lives and there are times when we have power over them, but we don't notice. And so a good therapist is able to notice those times and ask questions to help families and kids figure, how did you do that? Can we do that some more? Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't see that's I don't see people as broken. I, I, I'm probably am anti-medication because I'm looking at the research and there are all kinds of brain destruction from long-term use of medication and the research is showing that you know even one round of medication can cause problems in the body and the brain for a long time. And often our symptoms of depression, of anxiety, of anger, though those symptoms have a meaning. Mm -hmm. Let's get to the meaning and the root of it, rather than, as Dr. Williams said, rather than palliating it, rather than numbing people, let's find out what the symptom is. It's telling you you need to change your life in some way. So let's support people to do that. Right, right. And it's interesting. We have, um, I want to pick up this question from the comments um, Rachel, I know that you're on. I'm going to pick up this question from the comments from Lisa. Lisa said, I would like to hear from the panel why they think the prison system is set up to punish and not treatment focus. Mm -hmm. There are countries where prisons are providing effective care and successful reintegration with very low recidivism. And it's interesting. I, I like this question because I was actually looking at an article today in Sweden and in Sweden, um, how the criminal justice system is set up. It's set up where the individuals are not punished, but it's really much focused on, on treatment and mental health and everything. So I'm going to put this out there to the panel. Um, why do you think our prison system in Canada is set up this way? I don't know who wants to answer. I'll go. To take a shot in the dark. Uh, sorry, Devin, but to take a shot in the dark, I think it's just the prison system here is kind of based like right. in the States where it's like, mm -hmm. it's a business and it's, it's not about, you know, rehabilitating um individuals it's more of keeping the business going or at least that's how i see it and i i don't i don't want to you know put any conspiracy theories out there but like when i was in there there was there was no help like the programs that they're offering everybody they're like remedial programs that weren't really impacting people in the ways where they're supposed to impact people um and we all know that everybody that goes into jail is going to go back out eventually. So like, why don't you help these people in, in a, in a real way? And that was not happening. So the only logical thing I can come to think of is hmm. they want us to keep coming back, but I'm not sure if David no, had, a, had a different I view agree. on it. I agree with you. It's not about rehabilitation at all. I don't think because like you know, Warren said, there'd be, there'd be programs that are, that would affect you. Um, deeper and better so you don't come back in there you rehabilitate you but no they want they're getting free labor out of you and free programs and they're they're making lots of money off of you right lots of labor i know going up to like um like what up north there in, in uh penitang they're making blankets they're making socks they're doing woodwork they're doing all that stuff and not getting paid for it but that those those things are being sold so yeah, why get away with um, paying full full labor when you can get free labor? Hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I would agree. In Norway, uh, prisoners they know that people who come into prison are the most vulnerable in society, and yeah. so they give them mental health until they leave. They teach them how to read and write. They give them skills so that they uh, can reintegrate into so society. So that is not a punitive system. That is a restorative system mm. that is what we need restorative justice not punitive ju justice right yeah. but we're also in a place that we we're backwards we're we, just literally we are backwards um and you know from a canadian american perspective more of a westernized perspective we would prefer prefer to pour in money to just treat symptoms instead of pouring the money into the preventative mm. uh, 
measures so that you don't get the disease. They'd rather wait till you get the disease. I, I'm just saying this in general. They would they they have a system in which you know get the disease and I'm going to pour money into the medication versus if we pour them pour the money into the preventative measures, you would actually save you know, save your dollars. So meaning that, why don't you pour into restoration instead of this maintenance and this, you know, this, this, um, you know, turnstile type of, of fashion where it's like, well, we'll just keep them coming back because if we actually rehabilitate them, they're not coming back, right. you know, and, you know, we, we want our money up front. So, you know, unfortunately, and I mean, it may say it sound a bit sarcastic, but I think at the end of the day, it's a system that is that is a westernized um, system. It's how the government runs. And, and, and obviously with the government also means that's how the, the prison system is sort of seen as well, because, you know, it's, it's, you know, prevention is better than cure. Someone just, you know, put in the, the comment there. That's right. But we don't we don't fund that way. You know, if we actually funded prevention, we would actually be saving healthcare dollars. And I know that there was research quite a long while ago advocating for, you know, getting mental health as a preventative measure versus, you know, getting it one, or getting it sort of after the fact. If you had it preventatively, you would save at least 15 to 20% of your healthcare dollars being able to prevent a lot of these diseases that are chronic at this point in time. So if we just take that mentality, you know, if there was preventative, there would then be less people in the prison system. But even then, even getting in the prison system, give them, give individuals the help that they need so that then they can actually come out and actually come out, you know, you know, hitting the ground running instead of, you know, instead of, you know, with a, with a leg back, it's, it's, it's such a backward system. Yeah. Thank you for that. And it is, it is a backward system and, you know, and the thing is it being a backward system is one thing, but the impact that it is having on people who look like us. Yes. Right. And that is what the problem is that the majority of people who are in our prison system are BIPOC individuals. And then I know that Melissa actually quoted this yesterday that we as black individuals were what 3.5% of the Canadian um, population, but about eight, or 9% of those incarcerated. So there's a problem there. There is a problem there. And it being a backward system means that we are being impacted at greater and greater rates. And it's not only those of us who are within the justices, but it's also the families and the children's and the partners and all of that, that we're all impacted. So definitely there needs to be a change and we're all waiting for this change to come. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So um, Warren, I want to continue with you. You had mentioned that as an adult, you also did not receive any mental health education or, um, or support. Can you s speak on that? How were you able to educate yourself on mental health and mental wellness issues? So um, like Damien, um, I, I read, I, I literally self-educated. So um, the internet is a great tool that I missed while I was incarcerated. So when I got out, I, I, you know, glued myself to the internet and I, and I studied on things that I wanted to, that piqued my interest when I was in there that I didn't have access to the res, uh, research tools that I have now. Uh -huh. um, in my current um, occupation um, as a peer mentor in John Howard Society and Amadeus, um, I attend various um, uh, various uh, webinars and, and, and courses um, to reach the clients that I serve now. And um, yeah, again, it, like like Damon, it was just an interest of mine that, that I had to read for myself because I wasn't getting any education from anybody else. Okay. So um, it's interesting because like you mentioned that you're working with John Howard now and Amadea. So how is your current, in your current work and in your role, how are you able now to teach about mental health and about mental wellness? Um. I, I teach by by my, my experience, and um, if it's not just my experience, it's when you're in prison, like um, the people closest to you, like on your range or um, you know, on your unit, you become um, they, 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 you're you're very close with them. 
You know what I'm saying? So their drama is essentially your drama. You, you can't help to hear your friend's conversation with his girlfriend like every night kind of thing, right? So you you experience other people's traumas. So uh, with that, how I impact um, the clients I serve is I give them the experience that I have and I try to teach them based off what I've seen of what what I've been through and and um, I think it works. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And for sure, for sure it would work. And it's the idea that you're telling your story. You're trying to reach someone where they're mm -hmm. at so they could also learn from you. And by you opening up, it takes away that guilt and the stigma and the shame that's attached to it. Right, mm -hmm. right. Yeah, yeah. I think that some maybe we'll be out of a job if people start to be more deeply connected and more deeply intimate and reveal who they are to people around them. You won't need therapists. Yeah, maybe, maybe. <laughs> you have that in indigenous communities and in um, right. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, we were held, we were seen, we were known yeah. by twenty-five people right. in our lives, mm -hmm. and uh, you probably would need therapists then. <laughs> and it's very different from the Western model, right? Yeah. From more an indigenous perspective or an African center perspective, it's very much focusing on the us as a community. What are we going through? What are we struggling with? And how can we help each other? Um, there's another question here from Lisa. Do you, the fact that the majority of inmates come from marginalized families, less funding and progressive care is provided. Does the panel think if the majority of inmates or if a significant percentage of inmates came from wealthy, educated and non-visible minority population, mm. would there be more interest to look at better interventions? What a question. Yeah. Ooh, thank you, Lisa, for that. Well. <laughs> Who wants to jump in on that one? I have some thoughts. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I yep. think so. Definitely, 100%. 100%, yeah. 100%. Yes. Yes. Which, which, is, which is unfortunate, which is part and parcel, as Natasha, you always say, of the issue that if people were from a wealthy, educated, non-BIPOC community, that the services would be probably up front and center of what was needed. Oh, for sure. They'd be screaming down, you know, up and down the hills. You know, we need, we need, and they'll get like that. Uh -huh. That's right. <laughs> exactly, Ward. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, it's a shame because we're seen, we're, if we were seen on the same level, then they would be providing the services. But when they, when they see us as second class citizens, you know, and they don't believe that we receive, we require the same amount of rehabilitation as the next person, then they're like, oh, that's okay. Yeah. Right? And and yeah. it's it's disgusting. Yeah, it is, it is, I agree. I agree, thank you, Lisa, for that question. Um, Damien, I wanna move to you because you spoke to me about your struggle to find a path towards healing do you feel that, how, so I guess I wanna rephrase this question. It's like, do you feel that you are still struggling? Do you feel that the help that you need is available to you? I know the help is available. Mm -hmm. How do I get it, I think is the issue. And do I allow, how do I allow myself to trust a person to get me there because like I mentioned before to you during our, our conversation, I've spoken to people that I thought were meaningful in my life or care that I trusted and the the secrets that I've shared to them, it just, I was either laughed at, ridiculed, spoken to behind my back. So it's like, well, if, who do I trust, right? Mm -hmm. And who do I tell, who do I tell that to? So I believe, and I know the answers and the help is out there, but where do I go and do I get how, yeah, I have. I know I have to stay strong and keep fine. It's like a maze. I have to get out of maze. If I sit here, I'm gonna die, right? Yeah. So I have to, okay, hit this wall. Okay, bounce that wall. That's not it. Make it double back and make a couple U-turns. So I'm willing to keep going and finding my way out, but I know it's just difficult. It's tiring, right? It's tiring, you know? 
Right. So that with like plat platforms like this and panels like this, then it makes it easier for myself because now I know, okay, Warren's out here helping kids in the John Howard and, you know, and Natasha, and we have all these um, therapists where that look like me and who would understand my plights that I can actually reach out and speak to. And then, okay, that's working. I'm cleared up. Now I can go tell the homies from the hood, yo, listen, this is what's going on. There's a great person that we trust. And then word of mouth gets going and each one teach one and then it starts from there. But at first we have nothing. We turn to the block, we turn to drugs, guns, women, music videos, movies. We have nothing. So we were influenced by those things because that was our escape. The uh -huh. music was our escape. I could go to the club for a few hours and escape my reality. You know what I mean? It's just pacifying everything. It was never, and we did that for years. Our generation before did that, disco clubs and all that. So, and then the youth today, we can't really knock the hustle for the kids because they're trying to escape. They're dealing with it the best way they know how, yeah. right? So, yeah, I, I believe I definitely believe the help is out there. We just have to actively search, right? I think I think I think the cool kids have to make it cool as well. <laughs> yeah, make make mental health cool, make therapy yeah. cool. Yeah, I listen to Charlamagne all the time, and Charlamagne the God, and he's always advocating for mental health. And I'm like, he's somewhat respected in the community, so it's like, yeah. So people are actually speaking. So you'll hear young rappers come up and be like, yeah, I go to therapy, this and that. Or like a couple of years ago, nobody talked about no damn therapy and getting help. You know, we talk about the club and how much pills we could pop. But I think. Our community, I know my speaking, in my opinion, is that we do things that are cool. We make it appealing, right? Hence why I get, I have get rich or die trucking as my, as my slogan for trucking, because my culture is going to understand what that means. Mm. Uh, they get it, right? So we make it appealing, make it look cool. And then they're, they're, they'll join. It can't be boring. They, they, they won't look at it. So we make mental health and clearing up cool. And we got some kids. Nobody wants to do anything that's bored. <laughs> no, it's true. It's true. And, it, and it also speaks to the importance of cultural connection and cultural representation within a therapy setting. Um, I guess Natasha and Maria, both of you can speak on this. Natasha, do you want to go? Oh, the, yeah, the importance. How important is it? It. Uh, you know what it is? It's absolutely important because that's where your initial your initial point of trust, you know, starts, right? If I can see now, now here's the thing. I said it's an initial point of trust. We also have to be cautious with that because just because somebody looks like me, it may not mean that they espouse the same values that I do, right? So we're going in sometimes with that level of trust, but at the same time, we're still having to suss out whom this person is, regardless that they look like me. So I just want to preface that as well. But on a, on a grander scale of things, being able to see yourself, you know, in, you know, in that therapeutic relationship and dynamic is important. I have people that have come to me and basically said, I cannot be in a therapeutic session with my colonizer. Uh, uh. Right? How is my colonizer or someone who looks like my colonizer supposed to help me heal? Ooh. Right? And you know, and that's a word. Like uh. that, that's some power there. So they're now looking for, well, I need, and so the thing is that cultural safety uh, is yes. of the utmost importance. I need to I need somebody that looks like me who understands my journey, that I don't have to teach them teach the therapist about my about my journey because then if i have to teach them then it's now taking away from my healing journey because my healing journey is not about teaching you it's about me healing and i need the space for that yes right so that's you know that cultural safety and 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 and, and you know safety within that therapeutic dynamic is is huge the difficulty is is that we need more of us Yes. Right. Yes. So there's also, you know, this, that's a next topic for another show. I'll tell you that right <laughs> now. But there are serious systemic issues within, you know, the, the, the attaining of education and all of that kind of thing that keep a lot of us out. You know, there's economic issues in terms of being able to receive the credentials, mm -hmm. 
Huh? You know, to you know, to 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 do some of this work. I mean, there's, the, you know, regulations. There's a whole ton of other things that sort of, you know, keep a lot of us out uh, of this. But at the end of the day, we need we need more of us because our community is is crying out for it. Yeah, yeah, and it's true. I love that you mentioned cultural safety because that's what it is. It's about yeah. how can I feel safe to talk about all my hardships and all my baggage and all the years and years of stuff that come behind that to this person who's supposed to then help me heal and help me to understand and to unpack all of that so I can not only be okay today, mm -hmm. but going forward and for my children for the next okay. generation. And, the, and, the, and you're absolutely right, because the thing is, is that you're unpacking these symptoms that you're seeing presently or a lot of the, 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 the trials and tribulations and struggles. But if you don't understand where that is coming from, the cultural training and indoctrination and all of these other things that have been happening, you know, you're already in a one down position. If I have to start to teach you my, my Caribbean upbringing and culture, right. You know, that in and of itself is already a problem because now I have to teach you for you to understand where some of the roots of this lie. Whereas if I can sit in a therapeutic session and have somebody that part that looks like me that possibly has had a similar experience, we now have a point of connection to understand where the source of the traumas are coming from. Exactly. And that's huge. Yes, yes, exactly. I mean, even, if, even when we are black, we can be uh, have internalized racism. Oh, yes, oh, yes, yes, of course yes. You have, yes. And so you yes. have to be with someone. It's not necessarily a color. You can have a white person who has decolonized themselves and deconstructed things. So you know, sometimes black people uh, try to assimilate and be this um, and climb up the same ladder that has um, pressed them. them right there. Right? So. Mm. So um, you have to be with someone who's willing to question sometimes the dominant culture and the stories that we are told, even um, even if we're a therapist, because we can be trained in Western I, modalities, Western ideas. And I think lots of therapy, conventional therapy, are Western ideas about health and mental health. And a lot of um, people who don't come from that culture don't find it helpful. And mm -hmm. That's where narrative ter therapy was born out of indigenous cultures, because the founder of narrative therapy discovered that a lot of indigenous youth from Australia, a lot of indigenous people who were being sent to therapy were not finding it helpful. And so then he started to in interview them to find out what would be more helpful. And so the therapy comes around from marginalized communities. Right. Right, exactly, exactly. And it's those communities who are marginalized sometimes that have internalized the biggest racism and the biggest um, things that are told about us, mm -hmm. right? So we have to be very, very mindful, and especially from working as a therapist, but also someone who sought therapy, it's recognizing who is also working and on this journey of decolonizing themselves and their education mm -hmm. so that they can actually help me and reach me where I need to be. And that in and of itself is very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of questions that people are asking. I know Brian here has one. I think we can agree that words are power. With that being said, does the panel think that continuing to adopt words like minority only perpetuate systemic racism? And how do we move forward from this among other titles? Thank you, Brian, for that one. I'm not a minority nothing. I don't hey! That. <laughs> I don't no, no, no. And I, and I know what they mean by that, but even kids in the neighborhood, they don't even understand what that truly means. Right. Um, they hear minority and it automatically belittles them. Right. They're thinking subconsciously that, yo, I'm less than not minority in population, but just right. hearing minority or minority or minority or black, or minority, they're thinking you're a less than, right? So kids don't even understand what it really is. No, we're not minority, nothing. Yes. Um, What's another yeah. word? What's another word? I think that's what, um, was it? Ron? That's what Brian, yeah. So racialized, BIPOC, right? Mm -hmm. There are other words that are out there. Right. 
Okay. I gotta yeah. go get that um that red um dictionary. You gotta yeah. get that dictionary. Yeah. You Come gotta on. go find it. I have. <laughs> you didn't have the thesaurus that went along with the dictionary. Yeah, it was, it was in the back. Right. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh! I think we had some other questions. Sadie also had a question. Where can young persons from our community, thank you, where can young persons from our community who are dealing with trauma receive mental health support that is accessible, i.e. decolonized, cost-effective, and culturally relevant? Um, Sadie, unfortunately, Kevin couldn't be here tonight. He works at Sapacy, and I'm just going to pull up um, his little bio because he was actually telling me some very interesting things about SAPACY. So SAPACY, again, it's the Substance Abuse Program for African, Canadian, and Caribbean youth, and it is at CAMH. He was telling me that the program is self-referral. So you don't need your medical doctor, you don't need um, a psychiatrist, a psychologist, anyone to refer, it's self-referral. So unfortunately he couldn't be here tonight to talk more about the program, but that is a place where youth can go, especially if they're dealing with um, um, concurrent disorders with mental health, uh, substance abuse and other things. The SAPACY program is there. It's a self-referral. It's a free program because it's covered under OHIP, I believe. And um, that is a program there. Again, it is at CAMH, and a lot of people can say a lot of things in terms of CAMH. Um, however, Kevin, as well as uh, Donna Alexander, some other individuals who work at CAMH, um, who are from the African Caribbean community, are working very hard to try to decolonize a lot of the practices. And Kevin was telling me a lot of the different things that he does very much to pull in members of our community, uh, especially the youth, to access the services at the program. So that is, that's one of the um, programs that I do know. Uh, I think Carrie, Carrie was on as well. She works at SURF and I know that she works a lot with um, different families and families and youth and children. And Carrie, yep, yeah, there's Carrie's logo. Um, you could probably reach out to Carrie and she can give you some other information on what she does. So there are avenues out there. It's just that we need to have more platforms like this so we can come together, so we can speak with one another and say, hey, this is what I'm doing. This is what I'm doing. So we can become familiarized because it's too often where people are like, you know, I need help, but the help is not there. The help is there. But unfortunately, a lot of times we are working in silos. We need to work as a community. Right. Right. We need to work as a community. An interesting thing is, uh, Damien, when you and I were talking, you were mentioning about how hard it was, how hard it is to access community and how hard it is to be a part of community, how hard it is to have community to understand. Um, how important do you now view community and community support? Extremely important. Vital. Yeah, we need it. You know, I was um growing up you heard that term it takes a village it truly does and especially in the times that we're living in today where we always hear the old cliche um we don't stick together we need to stick together no we really truly do we really do half of the i think probably 85 of the things that um my people complain about it can be remedied by us just doing for self we really don't need um a lot of people right we can just help each other Okay. Right? Literally help each other, right? For the cause. You may not like me, I may not like you, but let's help each other for the cause because my children may need your children one day and vice okay. versa. You know what I mean? So let's, if you don't love me, at least love your children enough to put our differences aside and let's build. So I think it's extremely important. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for that. And Damien, what about you? Same question. Warren. Uh, sorry, Warren. Oh. What about, yeah. Sorry about that. I'm looking at you, but it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm sorry. Can you repeat the question? Yeah. So same question, community, right? As we were talking about community and community supports, and I know especially you're working with John Howard and Amadea. <clears throat> so how important do you now view community uh, as as a way to suss out support and things like that? Right. So I, I completely agree with Damien um, that that um, analogy, it takes a village is something that I hold to be true. And um, I, I think what we need to do is change the culture and we all need to come together. And as you say, not work in silos, but actually work together because we're not going to be able to fix this by ourselves individually or 
every organization has like a, their own piece and like there's no interconnection like we have to connect and the community has to you know has to um strengthen its communication with each other um nice thank you yeah i want to pivot a little bit and natasha i'm coming to you with this one how what do you think is lacking within the criminal within the justice system in terms of being able to adequately respond to 911 calls surrounding mental health help because we've had a lot of instances especially in the last i want to say 6 months where mm -hmm. individuals have been calling 911 for for mental health help and then we know what the outcomes have been Eight. right very tragic outcomes so what can we do like what what is lacking what what is going on there what is not going on well, yeah, I think that's that's the, that's that's the, the question. question. Yes, <laughs> that is not going on. Going on right? Yeah. Um, I find it's a difficult question because you know you you have someone that's calling nine one one for a mental health issue, and you have non mental health people that are that are are are, are, are answering the call. You know, people that are not adequately trained have no mental health training. Um, and then end up, you know, reacting in such a either violent way or or whatever the case may be because they're not adequately trained, yes. right? That ends up being the problem. Call nine one one. The first people set of people that are coming usually are the police, right? Mm. Police are not adequately trained to deal with mental health. They never have been. The training that I'm aware of with the police is is that it's a it's a two hour course, if mm. that much. Saying mm. you know if you have a person who and they have a certain code in terms of you know if if a person is is a is a is a mental health call you know, then, but even then that two hours, if lucky is absolutely nowhere near um, the type of training that somebody should be addressing that call. So I know that there's been initiatives where they've been trying to pair police officers with either mental health nurses or, or people that have more of that adequate training. Where the difficulty lies is, is that you also have um, a police culture that does that has difficulty dealing with mental illness and also ascribes to the stigmas yes. of mental illness as well. So they then go to these uh, to these calls and they already have a underlying stigma or belief about that individual yes. or those yes. individuals. So. I'm very skeptical, unfortunately, when it comes to, you know, calling 911 for mental health, because obviously, you know, I'm in despair, I need the help, but the training is not there, the experience is not there, and the people that are fielding those calls are not adequately equipped to actually deal with these calls. A lot of times what they'll do is they see, they see a lot of the, the individuals who are struggling and calling 911 as second class citizens, throw them in hospital, throw them at the emergency unit and then let's go along our way. So they don't even treat them as human, those individuals as human yeah. beings as well. So I I don't have too many good things to say really, to be honest <laughs> about, about that connection at all, unfortunately. It's, poor, it's poorly equipped. Yes, it is, it is. and and. Still, thank you for that because it is, it is poorly equipped. I mean, just for the sheer number of individuals in the last short bit of time, when we're in a time where everything in terms of mental health is exacerbated with COVID and with the racial injustices that are going on, you have individuals who are struggling, Absolutely. who are struggling with whether it is trauma or anxiety or depression or, or a collective of different mental health issues and people are wanting help. So where do they go? And then the fact that you're mentioning that there's a two hour training when you and I and Maria know how long we've gone to school Thank to you. be trained, Thank right? You. The years, the decades <laughs> when they've had two hours. If that. Right, that yeah, if that, if that. The, it's, it's insulting. It is, it's very much insulting. And it also speaks to the problem within our society in terms of mental health. Why is mental health not taken seriously when it is such a vital part of who we are? Mm -hmm. 
right? So there are definitely different, uh, definite lacks and, and barriers within the system. I know um, there's an individual, um, Asante um, Huffington, I'm probably messing up his last name, where he taught, he, he's organizing a outreach program called Reach Out Response Network to be able to provide a mobile mental health crisis response serving all of Toronto, led by teams comprised of peer workers and mental health workers and harm reduction. And he's been working with um, other partners within the field to really spearhead this and get this going. And this is something that we need. There is such a vital need um, for this within our community, within the Black community. Community, uh, within the Toronto area um, that I'm hoping that this gets off the ground and it actually gets used, mm -hmm. right? Because it's one thing if it gets off the ground, but another thing being used. So Maria, I don't know, what is it like in, I know you're in Alberta. What is it like yeah. in, in Alberta in terms of mental health responses to, to crises that are going on? Um, I think we have a social worker and a policeman that go out and, on a mobile response team and they will go out to uh, investigate and not just throw people in in um, in the hospital um, but they don't have enough of them I, I just know that sometimes they won't come unless the person who's in distress gets on the phone and say yes come <laughs> so sometimes the person in distress is is doesn't have insight uh -huh. trouble so I've had problems with it um, and where do you put people who are in that kind of distress do you put them in the hospital? Is there somewhere for them to go where we can de-escalate them and set them up in services? Because it's a crisis, right? Mm -hmm. So um, there's not anywhere to go but the hospital. And if the person isn't suicidal or homicidal, they're not taking them. That's right. And right. so if they don't have the skills to de-escalate and have the time, and you only have one team for a million people, like how effective can you be? So we do really need to pour... Um, um, money into mental health because the people who can afford it can can get it but the, the people and the majority of us even middle class people it's very expensive it's a hundred and what seventy five dollars an hour to see a private therapist or 45 if you're getting a deal <laughs> <laughs> so like um it, it's it, we need more opportunities for people to be well mm. yes yes and it does speak to again i know natasha you had mentioned this it's that it's the, instead of preventative, it's looking at the cure side, right? It's like, oh, there's not enough prevention in no. terms of mental health. There's not enough prevention that's put in, put into the system that's worked within the Canadian system. And right. that is, it's a lack. Oh, absolutely. It's very much lacking. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. So um, Warren, I want to go back to you, that you were talking to me about, um, the mental health skills that you have learned and how you use them in your everyday life. Can you, can you tell us about that? Uh, yeah, sure. So um, some of the mental health uh, skills that I've, uh, I've come to, to, to learn and to implement in my life. Um, I, I, again, I learned from self-education and um, whatnot. So um, I've realized looking back at my life, I suffered from anger issues and, um, mild bouts of depression um now after the whole um my pen bid ptsd and some of the things that I, I i use to combat these things is um certain techniques like um walking away from certain situations or giving myself mental space you know what i'm saying uh taking walks listening to music um things that don't necessarily mean taking a pill you know like medicating yourself just like uh talking to people, trusted people. I, I feel like when you when you vent to somebody that you can trust, um, that does wonders. Um, yeah. yeah, and I've, I've, I've picked up a few skills and I, it's, it's on, it's, it really pains me that I had to learn this on my own. I, I wish that they taught me this like in high school or, you know, yeah. even elementary or something, or even when I was in prison, like, you know, like a program was actually gonna, you know, teach me these kind of things, but so so was our lot and um yeah so yeah i guess that's that, that's my answer 
Yeah, no, thank you. And it's so interesting. Yeah. And I, I like that you've mentioned that, like you wish that you had learned that in school. These are mm. things that need to be taught the mental health education and emotional regulation and emotional processing skills are things that need to be taught from kindergarten. I mean, how many people have seen um, a young child, whether in kindergarten or younger, throwing temper tantrums, but they're not taught. Right. No, no one teaches them how to how to understand what's going on to regulate. These are skills that definitely have a place right throughout our lives. And I know, Maria, um, mm -hmm. when you and I were having a conversation, my little one was around. And mm -hmm. it's, it's so interesting because we started talking about different regulation skills and things like that. What are some of the stuff that you teach, especially um, that you're working within the schools and with with our with our young people? I, I do crazy things. I teach I teach kids to tap. I love I, tapping. I, I, I teach uh, um, teachers to put on uh, tapping videos in the morning or to do energy medicine uh, to clear it because we are atoms and molecules and nanoparticles and our energy can get mixed up by by other people's energy. So I teach uh, teachers to start their day by doing energy medicine or by tapping or I teach them about nasal breathing, that when you breathe in your nose and out your nose and you go in for five seconds and out for 10, it turns off the amygdala um, and it, it puts you into the para, into the calm, the rest, relax uh, system of your body. And actually belly breathing sometimes through your mouth can actually make you feel more distressed. Uh, but that nasal breathing actually oxygenates your brain better and your tissues and, and makes you breathe diaphragmatically. And, uh, makes you a better athlete if you practice. So I, I teach things like nasal breathing, energy medicine, tapping. I tell kids to ask their teacher for a walking break, that motion changes yeah. their emotion. Um, that if they're still stuck, they can come and talk to me. If they go in and they take a break and sing in the bathroom stall or dance outside on the field if their friend is making them mad, that this changes a hard emotion to a calming body. So I, I, t I talk about all those things. And, and because I'm so little in the school, like I, I just send out PowerPoints to teachers to, to put in their classroom to regulate their children. Okay, thank you. And that's some great information that you gave. And, and as you're speaking, it's so relevant for the age group, right? If you can start early, Mm -hmm. then this becomes something that becomes habitual and a way to take care of things. So then you have children who are turning into uh, preteens and then teenagers. There are, it's already programmed that, okay, mm -hmm. you know what, I'm going to go take a walk or I'm going to do some belly breathing or some nasal breathing and things like that to be able to really, really work towards feeling calm. Mm -hmm. Someone's asking you, Maria, if you can elaborate a bit more on the benefits of tapping. Oh, well, well tapping actually is a type of um, body, body um, I would say meditation, where you're, um, you're tapping certain acupuncture points in the body that actually turns on the relaxation part of your body. It also is a form of self-compassion because you're talking about, even though I'm having a problem of too much temper and it's getting me to yell and scream, I truly and deeply and completely love and accept myself the way I am right now. And just by doing that, you're talking about the problem, but you're giving yourself compassion. And it gives you, it opens up space for maybe for you to calm down and solve a hard problem in a good way. Right. Thank and sometimes you. tapping can get to the root. Sometimes you get memories. You get memories of where that temper came from. What triggered you to have that temper tantrum? You get memories by tapping. They come to your mind. Um, and what happens to people is when they've been traumatized, a lot of their memories do not get stored. And so small things can trigger a memory to hijack you from your calmness and take you out of your calmness and get you reacting as if you were in the original trauma. And so that, that's what can happen in traumatic memories. We don't store them. They're free floating and things can trigger them. And so the minute you start to breathe heavy or your voice gets elevated or you start to notice you're getting upset. That is probably a memory that's hijacking you at that moment. And you can calm down and, and then solve a problem that's happening in a good way. And sometimes tapping can actually get you to remember what it was mm. that uh, triggered the memory. Thank you. Mm. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because um, 
I recently found tapping and different tapping techniques, maybe a couple of months ago. And there's, there's actually some really good tapping techniques that are out there, especially for like racial, racial trauma, racial anxiety. Um, and I find that this helps and people actually like doing it because they're taking some of that, the healing modalities literally into their own hands to be able to unpack and to uh, deescalate where a lot of that trauma is locked within the body. Yeah, and the trauma is in your tissues. It is in your tissues. And so yeah. tapping also releases it. Thank you. Um, so let me see. Okay, we're doing pretty good for time. I wanted to speak with, I think we're doing really well in terms of our questions. I know I have tons of questions for everybody. Um, so I want to encourage everyone watching on our Facebook and on our YouTube channels definitely as you have here ask your questions I know people have been asking questions for people to more of their input definitely do that we still have some time so please please share please please comment and let other people know that we are on um, now so Damien when you and I were speaking I find it interesting because we're talking about you and your own healing journey, but then also you trying to and working with your your children and teaching them, right? So how do you go about doing that, especially that you are in your journey of healing and then being parenting as well? Um, I try to, well, not try. I, as I go, I teach. So teach. Mm. Right, so I'm more, I'm more open with them. Well, more my son, my daughter, not so much. She's still a bit young, and I'm, she's a female. But my son, I, I just, as I go, I teach him. So I try not to hide too many things from him. So, mm -hmm. it's, so they're, um, they're more well equipped and informed as they, as they get older. Like, um, as a commenter mentioned previously. Our parents and other generations did things a little bit different. So many things were hidden. We weren't, you know, you're a child in a child's place. There's certain things that we weren't supposed to, to hear about. But now that I'm in my generation, I'm like, well, maybe I should open up a little bit more because I know what I wanted to know as a child, you know, just simple communication. So I, I go with I go with that. Okay. Okay, nice, nice. And do you find that you get the responses that you are hoping for like yes. Do you, yeah yes like when i was I, when i was um i had a text message I was talking to my son i was on the road i'm like taking things today i'm like yes i'm like i'm a little nervous though he's like man, don't worry man you'll be fine i started <laughs> laughing right but okay. even even those things i i want to encourage vulnerability and free mm -hmm. speaking right because mm -hmm. i could be like i'm straight no, I'm a little nervous and I want to let my black son know that there's power and strength in being nervous or what appears to be weak, but it's not weak because you're actually expressing your feelings, right? To learn to express it. So he knows where I've come from. He's known my past, my my uh, my history in jail and stuff like that. And he's also seen my steps that I am doing now. So I think that's important that he sees both, uh, both sides and yeah, so for him to hear my past and then have me freely speak like this, I think it lets him know that, no, that's cool, that's strong, because he knows that he's not a weak person or a punk, so, but he can still speak and express himself, so I like that. I encourage my children to just speak. They're not gonna be rude to me. I still have that element of my broad you see, but. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? But yeah, I encourage them to yeah just speak. Let me know what's going on. I I, I haven't hit my children. I haven't had to. Um, I needed my butt whooped, so and I got it when I was younger. But my children, they just have it, and I think that's more because I more communicate with them. I can I can speak, and I'm learning to understand them as opposed to, oh, you're talking back to me. Go over there or come hold a slap. No, they're just they're not rude about it, but they're asking why, right? Why do I have to go do this? And I explain to them this is why you should do this. Or if I don't know, I'll just go find out with them. But yeah, I just I, I think I'm I'm teaching from um, experience standpoint. 
even in my entrepreneurship um, journey, right, for my trucking and stuff, I'm like, what I'm learning, I'm teaching you guys, but I'm going out there and get the information and I'm bringing it back to you. So this is what it is. I'm not, I haven't made it yet, quote unquote, what, what, uh, what society may call success or made it yet, but I'm teaching you the ropes. I'm on my way there, but I'm going to show you the journey. So this is what to do and what not to do. So I'm just teaching by example. Yes. I, I love that. I absolutely love that. It's taking, you know, taking the good of what you had in terms of the discipline to brought up C and all of that. And then also taking the things that you did not have wanting to have that, that open dialogue and being able to talk about um, nervousness and, and worry and all of that. And it, it does, it makes such a big difference because it allows you for one to open up and be vulnerable and to change your own narrative right, about right. emotions and about feelings and about how to share them and what vulnerability means. And it also teaches your children that, oh yeah, look, dad, dad is on this whole platform with every, all those people and he was talking about how he's being nervous and he's okay. Right. He's not weak, he didn't make a mistake. He's exactly. being able to be open and vulnerable and real, right? Right, exactly. So that, yeah. so it, it's, it's such growth. And especially for you, I know how hard it has been in terms to find the help Right, and you spoke, we spoke of um, not having the help while, while inside and, and not having the help from your probation officer and not being able to trust and all of that. And then here you are still making these differences and still going forward and, and having such a positive impact on, on you and your business and as well as in, on your children. That's yeah. Um, Lisa has another question. Do Warren and Damien think it's safe or realistic for inmates to provide freely to a therapist, would this be putting the inmate and their family at risk from both parole or youth protection workers as well as their prison peers? Why? So who wants to answer this? And I think I'll um, after Maria, you may want to step in after too. So Warren, go ahead. <laughs> I, I no, um, I, I don't. When I was incarcerated and I was um, a prisoner, uh, it wasn't safe for me to disclose to a therapist or anybody else the full extent of what was going on in my head. Um, just because they tell you plainly um, everything you say to them, they put it down in a record, and that record could show up in court. And if you're still waiting for trial, you don't want to say too much because mm -hmm. you want to get out. Mm -hmm. And if you're sentenced, you don't want to say too much because you want to get out on parole or you don't want to get more charges or you don't want them to put you in the deepest, darkest hole and have them strip you of your clothes and take your, your, your shoestrings because yeah. you said, you know what, yeah. the other day I was so, I was so upset. I want to um, hit myself or I want to hurt somebody. If you say that they're going to, you know, they're going to, punish you. They're not going to help you. They're not going to do anything. So no, in my opinion, it's not safe to disclose to a therapist uh, while you're incarcerated, the full extent of what you might be going through. I agree. You don't want to do that. You end up in the hole with the um, the suicide blanket on you. Yeah, it's not, it's not going to help you. No. That's actually like rule number one they teach you when you, when you first go to jails, like never ever ever tell anybody that you're suicidal because if you right. do that you're going to end up in a hole for at least i think it was 30 days 30 day watch or yeah. i can't remember the how, how long yeah. it is but yeah. it's a real yeah. thing like that's one thing you cannot say and then if you have to go back again then that's already on your record so you, you might not even go to general population you're going to the you know, suicide watch yeah. yeah no we don't really trust the, the yep. system it's difficult to trust any part because we looked at as well, we're in orange or whatever color and they're in blue. So it's us against them basically, right? I remember, I remember I had to do like a pre-sentence report. So I had to go meet with like the therapist and they were trying to make me out like I'm crazy. And I was speaking to the lawyer and I'm like, this is not going good. Then I remember going back to the range and I was talking to my friends. I'm like, man, they try to make me like thinking like I'm crazy. And I know I'm not crazy. Then I sat and I'm like, Wait, y'all think am I going crazy? Am I crazy in here? Because it started to 
start like, questioning what if yourself. I'm going crazy, right? You know what I mean? I'm like, what if I am going crazy? Am I going crazy? How do I tell if I'm going crazy? Well, I'm not crazy, but then you start thinking about these things because yep. these guys are they're telling you, and these are supposed to be professionals, but you know, but then do you really know? Hmm. Right? So, yeah, you know, I don't want to trust them. But then, like Warren's saying, those that stuff goes on your on your pre sentence report. Is is the judge gets to see this stuff? And it can hinder your chance at um, release and true rehabilitation, right? So, no, you keep that to yourself. Even more than that, it stays on your record forever. Right. Like it does not go away. Like, it, it's on your record. Right. So, yeah. There's a thank you for that, both of you. There were some qu um, comments and questions people were saying, like, wow, how is that helpful? Therapy should not be punitive. And I think we have spoken about that, how... Yes, it should not be punitive, the criminal justice system, but it is, right? And we have two accounts right here. Uh, someone else also said, do you think, uh, do you think that a therapist for jails should be separate from the system? This is an interesting question. Yes, I think so. 100%. <laughs> <laughs> my, lawyer actually, my lawyer had to bring in a he brought a like, therapist or a psychologist in from outside to um to speak with me and the the diagnosis that the therapist gave was extremely positive and way different than what the jails were trying to portray me as they wanted me to yeah i wouldn't have been home i'd probably still be inside there if it was up to them it was even the judge was like, this doesn't make any sense because she had conversations with me over over time, me going to my court dates, and she even said it's like this doesn't this doesn't make sense. This is not the same person, right? And it's a good thing my lawyer, because my lawyer had requested, no, we need to bring allow me to bring my own or a third party um psychologist or psych whatever in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm 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 sure like knowing you had someone like a third party come in, you are able to trust a little more. And when you yeah. trust a little more, you open up a little more, right. which allows the person that's supposed to be working with you to actually work with you, where you could more and more open up and be your true self and all of that. Right. Right? Yeah, you feel like you had someone who was actually had your back. So, you know, your lawyer was like, he's fighting for you from the outside. It wasn't in the system. Right. You know, right. you know, the system helping you, it's not, it doesn't, that doesn't make sense. I have another comment um, from Brian. They say it when they read your rights. Whatever you say will be used against you. They don't say nothing. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Zip it, close it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Definitely. Definitely. Um, were there any more questions? Any more questions or comments from our audience right now as we're starting to wind down? Does anyone have any questions or were there any questions? Or comments that I did not get to. There's a whole bunch. Yes, there's power and vulnerability. It's healing. There's nothing stronger than taking that on. Very true. Vulnerability. Once you can get to the space and the place of recognizing the strength and vulnerability, then you can allow yourself and give yourself permission to to open up and to be more vulnerable. So yes, definitely. Um, so there's one thing. Someone is putting, okay, Miss Bonita and Friends, Miss Bonita and Friends.com. I'm guessing that is connected to uh, working with children. Yes. Yeah, so those are books. There's a books that are, deal with I, uh, Warren and Damien talked about and having no idea of mental health. These are storybooks that parents can read to kids, that uh, community leaders can lead, read with kids, that teachers can read with kids that talk about every single issue that deals with mental health. Yeah. Nice. Uh, and it costs money, but there's a free web series too, based on the book. Oh, nice. So you okay. can look for the web series and um, I'm, I'm going to be working on a curriculum so that it makes it easy for parents and teachers and leaders in the community to uh, support kids around mental health. So they, they have series on a parent is ill. My daddy went to jail. Um, the COVID fear, COVID is here, the virus mm -hmm. of fear. And so, um, these books would be helpful if they were in schools and um, they were part of the health curriculum. Uh, I think that we wouldn't be having kids saying that no one talked to them about mental health because there aren't very many counselors in schools anymore. 
they have because of budget cuts and austerity these have been taken out of schools i it's a very rare thing that i'm in a school okay okay thank you for that miss benitas we have another comment here it says thank you thank you natasha and the other panelists for such an uplifting and encouraging discussion on such a frightening topic Warren and Damien, thanks for being so candid about your lived childhood trauma and being examples of resiliency. Yes, yes, definitely. I echo everything that is said. Definitely speaking about the childhood traumas, that is, that's difficult to do. And being examples of resiliency, talking about um, the hard stuff, quote unquote, that you've gone through and also being um, very open and willing to be able to show that vulnerability is not such a negative thing. But there could be a lot of strength in it. So thank you. Thank you, both of you, for being here and having this discussion with us. Welcome. So as we're winding down, I don't know if there's any other questions, but I think tonight we got some great resources, um, a lot of the different resources that have been spoken about. Uh, and just us being able to have this very fluid, dynamic conversation on mental health. And like some people said, mental health for a lot of those who don't have a mental health um, background or education or vocabulary seems to be very scary and very frightening, right? So I hope for everyone watching that um, us being on this panel, being able to dismantle a lot of the scariness around mental health and being able to see two individuals talk really openly about their mental health uh, struggles, that you can start to become more comfortable with mental health, what mental health is, the vocabulary of mental health, and also learning the different resources, whether it's going to YouTube or, or finding children's books or, or being able to recognize it yourself in your adult stage that, you know what, maybe there's some areas that I still need to work on that still need healing. And I hope that this panel has been able to do that for you. So as we wrap up, I want to, um, I want to just give everyone a chance to say some last words, some last remarks. Who wants to start? I know Damien, when you and I spoke, I had said, you know what, I have a last question for you. And you spoke really nicely about that. You were telling me about your future goals. So I'll, I'll start with you, Damien. So what are your future goals for yourself, for your family, for your community? And how do you want to start being the change that you want to see? Uh, well, for the change, I, I've already started. So speaking about my um, past and present experiences and living by example, I think that's one way I've started. I have my my Instagram. I'm, I'm very active on Instagram showing my people um, how to navigate the, the street life onto the entrepreneurial side, coming out of um, incarceration and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, my my people. I want I want us to I want us to be owners in in this lifetime, right? If you don't own anything, it doesn't have to be big, but own something. Whether it be land, real estate, it could be group ownership, it could be uh, whatever it is. Let's own something. Let's create some businesses and let's start creating generational wealth and passing it down for our our children. I know money isn't everything, but it is extremely important, right? And I believe that once we can once we take away the once we solve the issues of money, then we can, we're more open and I guess less stress so we could tackle everything else. Because I think in our community, money is such a, a huge issue because there's a lack of it. So if we could take care of the money side that we, okay, we have, we're financially independent, financial, sad, financial um, savvy, then we can take care of, well, stress relief and trauma and all the other stuff and we can just be a freer people, more open and more open to help each other because I've done a lot in my past of dividing and tearing down my community and my people. And I don't want my legacy to be of that. I, I, have, I have a calling, I believe the most high has given me a blessing and a reason to be here. And I want to, I want to start walking and living in that truth. It's more about my purpose that I could leave, I could leave behind, right? Um, the, yeah, it's just I just want to leave. Like I, I mentioned on my my on a story, on Instagram story, I said when I die, I will let my tombstone read, "I didn't give up." Mm -hmm. I, didn't, I did not give up, and I just that's how I want to live. I don't want to give up bef before it happens because my children are looking at me, 
my family's looking at me, my friends are looking at me. And I was having this conversation with a friend on the, in the truck today. I said, how does it look if I die today without fulfilling my purpose? There's many people that are going to um, succeed because of what I've created um, today. So if I, like, they're, they're gonna eat the fruits of the tree that I plant today. Mm. I don't plant and take all this time um, tilling the soil, fertilizing it, making sure it gets enough water, then I'm gonna be look. I'm gonna waste you. I'm gonna waste you. I mean, I, just, I didn't do my. I didn't do my part. I may not get the fruits of my labor, but I know that my children and my children's children and my friends' children could all eat from this fruit and be shaded from right. what I created. So I don't want to give up because me giving up is I could be letting down a whole bunch of people. Why? Because I feel tired when I can actually go on. So I use that as my why, right? Because I will. I I will. I wish someone did that for me. I was yearning for what I'm doing now. I was yearning for all my life. Mm. I know how that feels. I know how it feels to not have anything to eat. I know what it's like to steal a pair of shoes from Foot Locker so you can go to school in Jane and Finch and not get laughed at because you got on some old shoes from, from last year. I know what it's like to not have uh, mom and dad in the in the household. I know what it's like to to be like the a player on the one of the best players on a sports team, not have anyone there supporting you. I know what that's like. So I know it's like to be in jail and don't have anyone supporting you really either. So I just want those changes to to stop and start with me. So that's that's one of my wise man. Yeah. Beautiful. I love that. And people are asking for your Instagram handle. It is Jada underscore trucking underscore empire. So Jada Trucking Empire. Jada underscore trucking underscore empire. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. And Warren, last question for you. What are, what do you want to see? Right. What do you want to see for your future? What is the change that you want? Um, much like Damien, um, what I, what I want to see, um, what I want to see is the narrative to be changed in our culture. I want our culture to be changed because um, I grew up in ignorance and ignorance begot violence. And I feel like the more education that we have, the more we're, we'll be able to liberate ourselves from our current situation. And um, by communicating and sharing our stories and our experiences and not waiting for handouts and not waiting for somebody else to help us change, um, yeah, hey, Richard. Yeah. <laughs> um, I feel like that's what we need to do, you know, like we need to take our own future in our hands and we need to change the narrative, change the culture. And that's what I like to see happen. For sure. Beautiful, beautiful. And for those who want to reach you at Amadeus or at John Howard, how do people go about doing that? Oh, um, I have a uh, website, warrenabby.com. You can leave a message there or you can hit me up on Instagram. Um, Warren Gambino is my Instagram handle. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Dr. Natasha, as we're wrapping up today, what do you want people to take away in terms of mental health and and being able to advocate for themselves from a mental health aspect. Right. I usually say that um, we have to see mental health on the same plane as physical health. Mental health is whole health. And if we, if we treat it as secondary, then we are going to uh, unfortunately suffer in, in, you know, suffer in silence. So a lot of times because of the stigma of mental health, we will address our physical health very easily, but we're still not whole. We're still not healthy because we are only treating mental health as a secondary or, and we're not using it. We're not looking at it from a preventative perspective. So my takeaway, if nothing else is, is that mental health is whole health to be whole and healthy means to, to have the ability to address your mental health um, and being able to speak to your mental health, I think is of the utmost importance because I think the silence 
of the stigma and the silence of mental health is what is actually killing our community. So we really do need to voice and speak to, um, to mental health. And I think that's what is going to help the community facilitate that journey of healing. Right. Yes. Yes. Oh my goodness. I love that. I love that so much. It is. It's like, how do we help our community facilitate the journey of healing when there's so much issues with trust That's and it. when there's not enough of us who work from an anti-Black racism standpoint, who understand um, the different traumas and systemic traumas that are impacting individuals. So yes, thank you. Thank you for that. And Maria, as we wrap up, and I know you work a lot with children, what, what is the change that you would like to see made starting from a young age? Oh, act, there's no use making people feel good when they are living in circumstances that are mm -hmm. deplorable, whether, whether it's abuse or whether it's poverty or a deprived community. So uh, what I think we need to have is opportunities that we have in affluent neighborhoods, we need them in our neighborhoods. We need to have rec centers that are free or affordable. We need to have schooling where kids get to play and learn, uh, not sit in desks a lot, hands-on project, playful learning until they're in grade eight at least where school and, and, and going to school is fun. Um, that's how they teach kids in Finland. That's how we should teach our kids in our neighborhood through play and fun and hands-on experiences. So I, I don't think he, we even need, I mean, we need mental health, but if we were able to give communities that are economically deprived, the affluence that we have in upper middle-class neighborhoods, we wouldn't be using police to solve mental health problems. We probably wouldn't see our young people in jail. So mm -hmm. we need to change economic things and polit and use po polit politics to do that. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure exactly how to do it, but I know that that would solve a lot of mental health problems. Yes, thank you for that. And it's true. I mean, a lot of people are pushing for refunding the community. And that's exactly what we need. We need the mm -hmm. community refunded so mm -hmm. that we can have rec centers and other places for people to go where there where there's people there who could have appropriate programs and teach mental health and to be able to teach community building and bonding, especially at a young mm -hmm. age. Mm -hmm. So vital. Mm -hmm. And does need to be refunded. So thank you. Thank you everyone for being here. I see Richard. Richard, you've popped in. Did you want to say something? Yes, thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, definitely. I just like to say thanks. It was a very um, powerful uh, discussion tonight. And I just personally like to take the opportunity to thank the panel um, for taking the time to uh, connect with the community, but most of all to share your views and your experiences and Warren and uh, Mr. Blackman, I really appreciate it. And Dr. Williams and Maria, you know, thank you all for being a part tonight and stay tuned for our upcoming discussions. We hope to continue this very important topic and uh, be able to reach out to the community and to let um, individuals know that we have support. And there's a lot of individuals like yourselves um, who's been through situations that we're able to talk about this openly and, and share your views. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a situation where we all need to come together and address these things so that we can feel comfortable to open up and heal. That's a very important part. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Um, Maria and Natasha, just let people know where they can reach you at, whether it's social media or websites or such. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Oh, so for myself, I'm uh, I'm on uh, Facebook at Dr. Natasha Williams. Um, I'm also on Instagram and LinkedIn as well. Same thing at Dr. Natasha Williams. Um, you can probably get me at my email, which is a very funny email. It's alethiacoy at gmail.com and you can reach me that way. Um, I really don't have any other way except through my school website 
or my phone number. <laughs> you well, you can put in your you can put in your email, and then people could um, yeah yeah can reach that. So everyone, again, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for being a part of this conversation. Thank you so much for taking the opportunity to fight against the stigma of mental health. Thank you for sharing and for being open and and for talking about your journeys. And also, thank you to uh, Maria and Natasha for educating us. Mm -hmm. on mental health and Richard thank you thank you for found being the founder of keep six where we're mm -hmm. all here on this platform so everyone I want to thank everyone who's been listening people who have been asking questions and commenting all of our panelists have, has given you some way to reach out so definitely do if there's some questions that you still have or comments that you want to give um, definitely reach out to our panel um, everyone thank you so much I am Natasha Pennycook and I wish you all love peace and blessings <laughs> and good night. Good night. Good night. Bye. Bye.